Welcome to Naptime Nutrition. I'm Yafi Lavova, registered dietitian nutritionist with Baby Bloom Nutrition. And today with me, uh, we have a special treat. We have Michelle Redmond of the Taste Workshop. She has a lot of alphabet soup after her name. Let's see here. Um, M-S-R-D-N-F-A-N-D. She is a chef and a food enjoyment activist. And today we're going to be talking about oils and confusion and controversy. So let's just start right off. Um, Michelle, what's the best oil to use? <laughs> well, uh, I've been getting that question for a long time, which means that it continually is a challenge. Uh, the kind of information that's out on the internet makes it really difficult for people to navigate what's really going on with, with cooking oils. So I usually want to find out first, what are people cooking? You know, but to pick the best oil first, sort of match it up to what it is that you're, you're cooking because some oils have flavors, some do not. There's different smoke points for oils, um, which is the temperature that they begin to smoke when you heat them up. And that affects the, the flavor. Foods can become acrid and a bit burnt tasting. So knowing uh, some of those things is important, um, initially just to start off with. Okay, so there's no one size fit, no one size fits all oil. <laughs> Yeah, I think just like nutrition, right? <laughs> it's so individualistic. And uh, unfortunately, what I find is that there's a lot of fear-based information uh, on the internet about oil, and that makes people even more nervous about, about where to go with that. So I tend to break it down when I've done cooking classes into there's two major categories of oil. There's the refined and unrefined, and there's a quick way that you can begin to determine the difference. For example, this is a, the color of this, I don't know, can you see that that's kind of a light colored oil? Let's see if I can. Um, versus this dark colored. So this lighter right. colored oil versus the darker colored oil, this is a refined oil. And this is a peanut oil. And this darker color is an unrefined. So the way it's been processed with the unrefined, it has retained some of the polyphenols and some of the nutrients that keep its color, whereas the refining process, which is great for creating a great smoke point, high smoke point, has removed some of the things that cause color and even off smells. I mean, going through the refining process reduces some of the bad odors, bad um, flavor compounds, some impurities of it. So refining isn't necessarily bad. Some people feel like, you know, it's processed, but we have been consuming processed oil from the time that we were toddlers. <laughs> and so were our parents and, and their parents. So the that's one key difference is you're gonna, unless it's like a roasted, so not to, I don't wanna complicate it, but this peanut oil is roasted and it's, it's delicious. Yes, it's delicious, but when you start doing things like roasting oils, then they begin to potentially go off more quickly. They can, it's called, it's called oxidation. And, and we can talk a little bit about the nutritional, how you pick an oil based on the type of fat and how it stays you know, longer, uh, fresher, longer, and, and better for you longer. But that's the key difference is refined versus unrefined. And then, and then you have to decide, okay, so let's say I'm going to be doing some grilling. I want something that's really high heat or frying. You're going to lean towards a refined oil. And I did, I shared, I don't know if you had even a chance to look at it. I shared a handout that lists all of the oil differences in terms of the smoke point. So when, when you have an oil that has a really high smoke point, it's great for grilling and for frying. And an, an example of that is going to be a canola oil, a vegetable oil, those are refined oils. You have some oils that are unrefined that have a higher smoke point, but in general, it's the refined oils that are gonna be good for, for that. Right, so I'm showing that, I'm showing that I'm handout now, and I think it's, I think it's great to go based on um, 
based on what you're doing with it, I, I shared with you when we were kind of prepping for this talk that the first time I used coconut oil, which has a very high smoke point, um, I, I remember it, it hit me like a light bulb went off. This is what it's supposed <laughs> to look like because I was so used to the other oils that I was using burning in the pan and I didn't realize that's what was going on. And when, when you have an oil burn in the pan, it changes the flavor of the food. It certainly changes the amount of smoke that's in your house. And it's also going to impact the nutrition of your dish when you're using a, a burnt oil. Well, the, uh, the, the smoke itself is something you don't want to breathe in. I watched a lot of cooking shows where the chef says, get it smoking. And I think, no, <laughs> because that, that smoke can produce a chemical called acrolyne. And acrolyne is shown in places where people are doing a lot of cooking and they're smoking. The, the lungs are the first to get hit by, by this particular compound. So you don't want oils to, to get to that smoking point. And in terms of does the heat change the impact, the nutritional composition of the oil, it, it, it's a very subtle change. Uh, you have to really heat a oil to a high level, often multiple times. You can get start to get oxidation because anytime an oil is exposed to the heat, it's going to oxidize. So you do have that beginning to occur, but you don't have a lot of change to the polyphenols and lignans and these nice antioxidants and trace compounds that are, are in, uh, in particularly unrefined oils. So that's um, kind of how that shakes out. <clears throat> okay. So what I'm hearing is there's a real concern if you have a deep fat fryer and you're not changing out the oil regularly and you're using the wrong oil, then you're really compounding issue upon issue. <laughs> right. And, um, you know, who doesn't love French fries at home? <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, and, and usually if you do fry something at home, at least in my case, I don't do it too often. I like fried food, but I just don't do it too often. So I don't want to buy an expensive oil, whether it's refined or unrefined. I'm using a couple cups of something that I'm often likely to toss out. So I was, I was at Sprouts the other day, and I noticed that they had a lot of oils that have become popular, like avocado oil, almond oil, that do have high smoke points. Uh, and come in refined or unrefined. And they're touted as, oh, use them for frying. And I think, at $8 a bottle? <laughs> That's a really cherished French fries I'm making. So <laughs> that's the <only> thing. <laughs> Generally, unrefined oils are going to be more expensive. So that's the reason why when people get a fry, it's often vegetable oil. Um, it's not the kind of oil that gives back to you in terms of it doesn't have a lot of, of interesting nutritional benefits. And it's an oil that we get in every food that we eat. We eat, eat out at restaurants. You eat any kind of even, even what you would consider really good frozen foods or packaged quality foods. You're often going to have a form of vegetable oil in there. So we get a lot of that oil, which is high in omega-6 fatty acids. And most Americans need more you know this. I mean, we all need more omega-3 fatty acids. So one oil that does do that, there are a few, but the one that you know can be commonly used and also isn't that expensive is the is canola oil. So I have some organic canola oil here, and it doesn't have direct omega-3 fatty acids, but it has alpha linolenic fatty acids, which can convert inefficiently. But <laughs> to omega-3 fatty acids, because there's a bunch of enzymes that have to be present. There's a competing pathway in the body. So if you're eating um, vegetable oil and then you're also trying to have flaxseed oil or one of these oils that's high in omega um, alpha linolenic, you may not get the full benefit of that. Whereas if you were having a piece of salmon, you're going to get the, the full benefit of that. So that's one of the advantages. So I, are you still there, Yaffe? <laughs> I think we've had a little Wi-Fi glitch. I'm going to go on and um, mention a couple other things related to that. The um, the other thing that I think is is confusing about 
what kind of cooking oil to select is, are you gonna go with a flavor or um, a lower flavor sort of oil? And when you look at, that's another differentiator between refined and unrefined. So the unrefined oils, like olive oil, if you think about that, it has, it has flavor. Unless it's one of those pure olive oils that has been, um, doesn't have as good a quality of olives and the processing is different. It doesn't rank as, as high as an olive oil. That kind of olive oil is going to have a low or bland. I call it the everyday uh, olive oil. So that's the more inexpensive ones or pure, sometimes they're called, or extra virgin. So um, then you can buy your special um, olive oils that have a lot of flavor, a lot of complexity and certain intensity. And I don't saute with those as much. I use them for vinaigrettes and desserts or baking or to drizzle as a sauce. So let me, I think I'm getting a note from Yafi uh, here because I think we've gone. <laughs> Yafi has frozen. Um, let me just ask her what, what we need to do here. <laughs> I have a little cooking show I do online live, and I've always wondered if this would happen to me too. <laughs> okay, let's see if I'm supposed to set the reset the um, screen here. Okay, sending a message. I don't know if I'm live here. Is anyone on? I'm looking. I'm here. Oh, I'm live. Okay, I'm still live. Where are you, Yafi? <laughs> Well, let me see if she comes back. Okay, great. Thank you, Michelle. I, I see you. I'm gonna continue. I can't totally see people's comments, but let me let me see. I, oh, I think I can now. Okay. So hopefully we'll get Yafi back and uh, she can let me know what, what the next step is, is going to be. The handout, I, I have a handout that was shared um, and that she'll share with people on this call or on this show. And one of them lists all of the different refined and unrefined oils and gives you the, the smoke points for them as well as the different kinds of fatty acid composition. So here we are. Um, nope, still don't have Yafi online. Let me ring her. <laughs> we, will, we will figure this out. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna put call Yafi and put her on the phone because we're gonna have we're gonna make this happen whether she's live or not. And uh, I really like this kind of way of looking at it because you can pick the oil that are fattier. Yafi, how are you? <laughs> yes, we're continuing with the show. Uh, Michelle Mish uh, Fiorenza said that uh, I'm still on. So okay. if you need me to let's log out. Just, sorry. Okay. Just and talk about rancid oils. Okay, I'm gonna leave you on. How's that? You're just gonna stay on. Um, no, I have to be down to the Chinese and I want to get back in. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hope to see you on the other side. Bye. Don't we love technology? Oh well. Um so this is gonna be uh, shared with you and it just breaks down one page refined oils and the other for unrefined. And not that we expect people to, well, let's hang this up on our refrigerator. Wouldn't that be um, fun and interesting? But at least uh, if you are curious about shopping for different oils and what type of fats they have, how much saturated fat do they have? And the in terms of nutritionally, I try to simplify it because if you think about it, a lot of these oils have been present and used in many cultures for thousands of years and when you see news that says oh olive oil is bad for you or now this other oil is bad for you you have to, i have to think when i look at some of these countries that have high use of olive oil and the evidence shows that it's good for you 
I think we're getting a little too concerned about you know, what percentage of this kind of fat or that kind of fat do things have. But having said that, going for monounsaturated fats as a high percentage is a good way to go. And let me tell you the, why, just simply, it oxidizes less than the other types of fat. So olive oil is really high in monounsaturated fats and it oxidizes less. So it can stay in your pantry longer. It can handle um, a pretty nice saute up to 350 plus degrees, depending on the type of oil it is. So you have a lot of flexibility. Are you here, Yaki? I'm back. Hopefully I'm back for good. Sorry about that. No worries. We got through it. <laughs> so I was just talking about uh, a little bit more about why monounsaturated fats are a good way to go with uh, oils if you're trying to like pick something more nutritionally beneficial for you. We talked a little bit about oils that are high in um, alpha linolenic uh, fats. So that's okay. <laughs> that's where we are. <laughs> I was disappointed to have gotten kicked out, but I'm glad you carried it. Okay, let's do the demo. I'm so excited. Oh, yeah, let's do that. Because I want to talk a little bit about saute. And if there's any questions about, you know, choices for oils or um, a little bit of, of techniques. And I'm just going to share sort of how to optimize sauteing. Because in I've taught cooking classes to in culinary schools. And I've also taught in colleges and, and public uh, locations where I've gotten to watch 25 people in five different kitchens cook uh, recipes. And it's, you know, what are foundational skills and, and saute is uh, something we use a lot, but there's just a couple tricks that, that, that aren't always employed. And so the first one is to get your pan warm. Uh, it doesn't have to be really hot, but get your pan warm before you put the oil in it. And, before you do that, make sure whatever you are cooking is, is not wet. Because if you put something wet in on top of an oil, you know it's going to spit at you. So that, then you're like, ah, should I have dried it? But it's also going to, that, that water in there is going to reduce the temperature a little bit. And then it's going to cause steam. So whatever's in there is now, instead of you're wanting to get a nice, crispy, brown, colorful, flavorful okra, you're gonna get something that has now steamed and it's gonna be mushy. And with, with okra, and I picked okra because it's America's favorite vegetable, <laughs> right? <laughs> Is it? <laughs> I'm on a mission to make it a favorite vegetable. So. <laughs> okay, I'm putting you back on solo again so everyone can see. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I could choose to use an olive oil because I'm going to get this a bit warm because uh, I want it pretty, pretty hot you know, between 320 and 350 degrees because I, I want it to get some nice crispy edges because people think of okra as being soggy and mucilogenic. Mmm, that's delicious. Um, but that's how I experienced it. <laughs> yeah, that's how most people have experienced it. I grew up in the South. I, grow up, I, I spent a lot of time in the South during graduate school. Um, I also can choose to use grapeseed oil, and that, this is the case I'm going to do that because I actually don't want the flavor of olive oil. So my rule of thumb is like 1,001 as you pour is about a tablespoon because I'm lazy. I hate to clean. So anything to avoid cleaning. So that's about a tablespoon and a half. So the reason I want the pan warm before I put the oil in is that the, the, the pan, you can't see it, but the surface of the pan is full of little pores and scratches and divots from all of our wonderful cooking. And when I heat it up, the metal is going to you know, open up a little bit and it's going to allow oil to go into all different places. So that if I put a food down and there's not a couple spots where the oil looks like it's kind of coated, but it really hasn't coated well. It's not gone into the little crevices. And I, I don't want to do that. So I want to make sure that I've got uh, the best opportunities for not sticking. The other thing that happens is that we're often too uh, afraid to put a little extra oil in. And depending on what you're cooking, you know, when I cook salmon, I put the smallest amount of oil right where I put the salmon skin down first because I've already got a lot of fat there and it comes out, so I don't need a lot of oil. And 
also, let's say I'm cooking with a, a, an oil that I want some of the flavor uh, to, to, to get in after I'm done cooking it. Maybe I'm looking for coconut oil to be a flavor. And by the way, Yoffi, remind me, there was a just recently a big brouhaha about uh, co coconut oil. I don't know if yeah. you had a chance to, to see that. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit yesterday when we were um, prepping for this. And and the whole thing with coconut oil is that people were convinced that it was going to save the world. And then, then this research came out and this whole, this video by a certain organization came out and then people thought, oh, it's gonna kill you. And the truth is that it's not that black and white. Coconut oil is an option. You know, it, it's nothing is with nutrition. <laughs> but, but there was, let me finish this and I'll tell you what I heard yeah. yesterday. Um, so your oil needs to talk to you before you put the food in it. And okay. it's gonna, so it's either gonna be, depending on the type of oil you use, the heat it's, it's at, it's gonna have what I find to be four different things that occur. I've never read this anywhere, but this is just from all the years of, of teaching cooking. My oil is gonna talk to me and tell me it's ready, like just before the smoke point, when it either dimples, so it kind of looks like a golf ball, you know, the surface of a golf ball, or it could get this sort of wrinkled kind of look to it. Or it can have sort of a fractionated, like a broken window shield look. Uh, and the, the last one that I see is, it's gonna be, I call a shimmer or a wave. So it's kind of like, it's like moving, like a little bit of wave action or shimmers coming in. And when you start to see that happening, it's usually soon after that, that you start to get a little smoke. Um, so I usually catch it right before that happens. In this case, you can't see it, but this particular oil likes to dimple. So it's dimpling um, and it's, it's almost ready to go. I don't know, Yaki, have you ever heard any other uh, tips like related to that? No, this is my first hearing that and that's really awesome. I just usually guess. <laughs> Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm not a real team. chef. This is why I, I teach toddlers, because adults can figure out that I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> no, you're fantastic. Um, no, I was te te teaching a class um, a couple months ago, and we were making a special, we were making pasta from scratch, and then a sauce, and it turned around, and I heard this splattering, and I said, oh, what happened? And this woman said, oh, I was testing to see if the oil is hot by throwing some water in it. <laughs> Yep. Which, which I think I've, I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah, that's, that thing, is what I learned. And the next thing is I want my saute to sing to me. I want some talking. And when it's talking to me, I know I've kind of nailed it, but that is, it's hot enough. And okay, I'm being fussy by putting these in like this. Normally I would have a bigger pan, I would toss them all in and then shake them up and down. Um, but I'm just doing this like this so that you can see what a really quick brownie looks like on, on one side. Um, so I'm putting down flat, you know, if you can see, kind of being a, a little too orderly with it. <laughs> I don't have the patience to do this normally. So you can hear it maybe? Maybe not. Um, so it's not talking to me, and so I know I'm, I'm good. Now the next last thing that happens that people, um, often disrupt the saute because we take our, our tongs or we take our spoon and we start pushing at it and checking it and moving it around but you don't want to do that because most vegetables this oil tends to be a little on the drier side but most vegetables once you start heating them up and pushing them their cell walls start to break down and water comes out and that water just like i mentioned before reduces the temperature causes steam reduces Brownie, uh, that means less flavor, and uh, the texture isn't going to be as great. So that's uh, that's why I'm doing it um, that way and not not moving. I'm going to wait till they're they're brown. Uh, Yappy, are you still there? I am still here. Um, what 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 are some tips for? Um, I know you said most people saute in uh, maybe not the most desirable way. So aside from using the proper oil and the proper timing with the oil, what are some things that you can really be on the lookout for? While you're sauteing? Yeah. I mean, you. so I would, 
not, I don't know what I'm doing, as I've said. Uh, so I would be constantly moving it around and stirring it. And you seem kind of like you're having a peaceful moment with your okra. Well, I, okay, I'm going by sound a little bit. As things begin to cook in a saute, the, the water begins to, that's in there, does begin to evaporate. I hear it, it usually gets a little quieter. So that occurs. And then I can sometimes smell uh, when the caramelization that's called Maillard reaction um, has, has begun a bit. But mostly with vegetables, you're talking about um, caramelization. And so, yeah, see, I'm starting to get some browning here. And I usually will pick the one up that's in the middle because even if you have the best pans, usually the one that's in the middle or if you have hot spots in your, on your pan that tends to go a certain way or on your cooktop in general, I go for picking up one there to kind of see what it's like. So those are some okay. tips for trying to decide when it's, when it's done. You seem to be having a very and, mindful uh, experience. <laughs> You're, yes. you're using visual, you're using sound, you're using smell. Well, and also, the, if you're doing a bunch of different things, you've got kids you're taking care of and other dishes you're taking care of, this sounds a bit fussy, but you could you could reduce the heat after you've gotten it going to some browning, reduce the heat, uh, flip things over, you can finish it later, but at least you've got you know, a nice, nice saute of color going on um, in the one part. Um, so let's see here. I'm gonna pull one up as soon as it's brown. And the way I would finish this particular dish is maybe with a little. I throw some cumin seeds in here, toast them at the end. Some chili, might do some orange zest, squeeze some orange uh, in there, and finish it with uh, maybe a little coconut oil, uh, something a little bit southern, um, southern Indian. <laughs> okay, are we still live? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, you can't tell, sorry. <laughs> My screen's frozen. Now. Oh, it, yeah, I'm I'm having a little technical uh trouble over here, but so um so you haven't spoken about how to tell if an oil is rancid yet, right? Just briefly that um uh, see now we've got okay, I'm gonna bring this for a closer. <laughs> this is my Slightly brown. We could go a little longer. Okra, and so it's crispy. It's not crispy. It's not. It's not you know kind of goopy and stringy that it that it gets. So that's how I would do that. Okay. So rancid oils. I really recommend that you check an oil. Sometimes even if you brought it home from the store and it's your first time using it, give it a sniff and and maybe taste it. I have been surprised lately. But I've picked up oils at places that have a lot of turnover at grocery stores that I really like. A couple times in the last six months, the oil I bought was off, it was rancid. And I, I broke my rule. I wasn't, it's a brand I buy all the time. I cooked something up and went, whoa, what's that? You have a great description for rancid oil. I want you to share that. You told me that. When I was in my very first nutrition class, the, the teacher passed around a bottle of oil and we all smelled it. And I thought it smelled exactly like crayons. And <laughs> that's, that's the rancid flavor. But what I learned from that experience is not only how to tell if an oil is rancid, but also um, seeds and nuts, foods that have high oil content can get that same smell. So for instance, I bought a bag of shelled sunflower seeds and they had that smell. And that it, it just takes over. And Michelle, you were talking about about um, pine nuts being high in oil and that the same thing can happen. So if you think that you don't like nuts or seeds, yeah. that could be part of the issue. That was my issue. I thought I didn't like nuts and it turns out I was I was eating rancid nuts. So yes, yeah. So I've worked in commercial kitchens where they were storing nuts in the pantry that a pantry that was not air temperature control. So beginning 80, 85, and things were going bad pretty pretty quickly. So there's that. There's the you can pick it up by the flavor and the taste. So I just recommend changing it, checking it periodically. And as I mentioned before, some oils are very resistant, like olive oil, because it's high in monounsaturated fat. So it's more resistant to oxidation, which is what starts to to break down the the fats. And so heat. 
Um, air exposure, don't you don't want to store your your oils anywhere where there's light. You might it might look cool if you have some cool bottles, but it's going to start to oxidize in just the light alone. If they're stored above a cooktop or an oven where maybe if there's warmth that's coming up, that extra heat over time is going to oxidize it. There are cute olive oil or oil pourers that don't that have a little open top, a little nozzle. That air is going to cause the oils to oxidize unless you use it pretty, pretty quickly. Um, this one has a, a little cap on it, so that keeps it keeps it good. And yeah, so it's they're they're not good, they're not flavorful to eat, and they're not giving back to you health wise. So that's how to avoid that. Right. Right. Okay. So so, so to give the cliff notes of what we're talking about. Okay. What is your, what's your favorite high heat oil? <laughs> if you could just pick one. Um, my favorite high heat oil that I, that I am willing to pay for. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it is canola oil. And I know that there's a huge amount of, of frustration about the information on canola oil. And I, you know, I'm trying to help um, bust some of the myths that are out there about canola oil. I'd have to hear from people to see what what their thoughts um, are currently. But I, I've been hoping that um, there's been enough information out there about how it's it's actually a, a very simple refined oil, like all the other, like the vegetable oils, safflower oil, corn oil that people eat every single day and have been for, for decades and decades. But the reason I like canola oil is that it's one of the few cooking oils that uh, has alpha linolenic acids and is the lowest in saturated fat. So it's a pretty decent oil to use for high heat. I tend to, I, I tend to go with the organic, so it's a little bit more expensive. But when you go back to this, um, chart here, it's about 10% uh, alpha linolenic acid, which, you know, we said doesn't convert very efficiently to omega-3 fats, but when we're all struggling to get that, every little bit helps. So that's why I tend to like that oil and I can buy it, you know, pretty much only refined here. I have not found, if anyone knows, please tell me if they have found unrefined canola oil. When I was, I went to a cooking school in Paris and lived there, and it was really easy to find unrefined canola oil. It was beautiful, um, yellow, bright yellow color, just like the, the flowers that you see if you're in Canada and driving through the canola fields. So we have a question, have a question. by another Michelle with um, <laughs> What is your opinion on organic, uh, organic sourced oils versus non-organic? Should we be conscious of non-GMO? Well, that's a whole conversation in and of itself. <laughs> yeah, so I'll just I'll give you my, my simplistic answer, which may not be satisfying. Um, but first, there are very few GMO crops approved for use and in the, the American food chain. So it's, it's kind of surprising because I think now we're up to eight approved GMO crops in the country, and not all of those are for food. Some of them are just they're not stuff we, we don't, I don't eat alpha alpha and I don't eat cotton. Um, so I don't care. <laughs> Another don't care about how it's made. It's just in terms of food, whether that's GMO doesn't affect me. But, you know. So the, 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 when you go to a grocery store and you see non-GMO, you know, these are non-GMO okra. It's like, there's no such thing. So it's kind of confusing. It makes you feel that that most of our foods are GMO, and in fact, very few uh, of our foods. Now, because corn is such a big uh, product in terms of GMO, and corn oils show up in lots of places, that's one of the reasons why food companies will say, oh, I want to create a product that I can put the non-GMO label on it, so I'm, I'm not going to use corn oil unless I can source an organic corn oil, because anything organic um, is not supposed to have a GMO food supply chain linked to it. So that's that's kind of my, I think I sort of answered the question. In terms of organic though, uh, I do, I, I like 
the concept of, of organic. Uh, I don't don't make a huge deal about it in my my life, um, but I do tend to like it canola oil. I, I tend to get organic if I can't get it or it's too expensive that month. I might go, oh well, you know. But I that's just me. That's where I'm sitting on that topic. Sounds like a pretty balanced view. Like yes, there's just too many things that could that I don't want to have to be controlling and worrying about too much. Uh, there are bigger things um, in terms of, you know, an oil being organic or, or not. But I, I think it's a good question. And I think that um, if you are really like the way organic agriculture is done, then that's, you're going to support um, probably going oils that way more. And I tend to feel that way, but I'm also not uh, super strict about it. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree the same way. Um, the, and also, when you brought up the corn and corn being confusing, um, it, it's interesting to note that some corn products and processed corn products could be a concern for GMO. But if you go to buy corn on the cob, that's never GMO. You're not going to find GMO corn on the cob. And just as you said, I, yeah, I remember can. being in the supermarket yeah. and seeing all these things labeled non-GMO and you know, <laughs> laugh because, yeah, no, that's there's, there's no GMO eggplant available. So, yeah. <laughs> right. And, and the organic, the corn that is um, corn on the cob is going to be sweet corn. Mm -hmm. that you can, I mean, sweet corn or may not be strictly sweet corn. There are some, there are some corns that, because strict sweet corn is only sold for few months technically sometimes up to six I met a sweet corn farmer recently <laughs> um, but you're right because the the GMO um, corn that's for livestock has no flavor it's you you wouldn't eat it you couldn't sell it so that right. you're, you're right it's confusing right and that's it's being used for livestock it's being used for for corn syrup manufacture for corn oil but it's not on the shelf that you can pick it up and buy it so that's it's it's an interesting point to make. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. I'm doing a, a cooking show with a chef in a couple of weeks on sugar. <laughs> We're gonna talk all about those topics um, and how to seek out flavor in desserts, you know, uh, sweet versus sugar. And so mm -hmm. we're gonna dig into that topic a little bit because there's a lot of confusion about that too. And that's a great that's a great topic because at some point sugar becomes a texture, and that's not something yeah. you want in a nice pastry either. You 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 don't want to feel that crunch under your teeth, and um, I know I've been there. It's not something that's very pleasant. Sugar is not a flavor. Um, you use it you use it for chemical reactions. You use it for um, to to enhance other flavors and to bring out other flavors. It's an important ingredient in a lot of different dishes, but it's not a flavor in and of itself and shouldn't be used as such. <laughs> yeah, I think if people get more picky about, I want flavor from this dessert, not just sugar. Um, yeah. Just kind yeah. of like these fats, I want, where can I get what I want that have, you know, the flavor that I want, but can it give back to me in some tiny way? <laughs> yeah, and I also find with heat, I love heat in my food as far as um, spicy flavors, but it's got to be the right spice paired with the right dish because you can't just throw sriracha on everything. You know, I can <laughs> use things, but not everything, right? So yeah, I, I, I've had to train some students to put down the bottle of sriracha. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to figure out some other way to uh, have flavor in this dish, even if, even if it's um, a spicy flavor. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I do want to mention one other thing just briefly, because a couple days ago, this kind of went viral. A professor at Harvard, um, she's in a department at Harvard, and she was giving a lecture in Germany, and she said that coconut oil was basically, she said, a food poison, and you should never eat it. Now, this was from a German article, so I can't, a couple other, other people reported that, yes, she did say it's like a poison, and you should stay away from it. So I don't know if there was a translation thing there. I went to the Harvard website, and they seemed to, you know, 
<laughs> was what she said. But it, it did concern me because their focus was saturated fat. Coconut oil is 90 to 92% uh, saturated fat. And there was, was just a real focus on, geez, you shouldn't be you know, consuming this. But I took issue with calling it a poison, with, with any food being called a poison, unless it really is a poison. <laughs> right, right. So that made me sad. Not, not that I, I use coconut oil for flavor periodically. I have refined and unrefined. And as you mentioned, it has a high smoke point, particularly the unrefined. People like it uh, also because it's high in medium chain triglycerides, which our body uses really quickly and efficiently as fuel and doesn't store uh, very well. So that's why it's shown up in a lot of weight loss sorts of studies, um, but under very specific conditions. And I, I hear people telling me, oh, I take two tablespoons of coconut oil a day. And I, I like, you swallow it? <laughs> Yeah. Some people are doing it that way. Some people are putting it in smoothies, um, sticking in other ways because they feel it's going to they're going to lose weight. Um, but that's you know that's an extra 260 calories, and it has oh, well over six times the amount of I guess ten times the amount of saturated fat as olive oil. Yeah. So it's just. I think that's where people were hanging out on that issue is, oh, it's too high in saturated fat from, from what I read. I just, I took issue with it being called a poison. I, I think, uh, anyway, I use it. So I'm mentioning, I use it. I don't use it every day. Well, we shouldn't call any food a poison. Fear mongering is not a, is not a hallmark of our profession, um, ideally. And mm -hmm. we should really just give give good information that help people to have a healthy relationship with food and calling something poison when it is not objectively poison is, is really not doing anyone any favors. Um, coconut oil was never going to be the miracle life saving anything. And it's also not going to kill you. It's a viable option that you can have in your pantry and use it appropriately as far as um, heat and flavor. And it's it's not going to save your life, and it's not going to kill you. So there's no reason well, to be dramatic either way. <laughs> I had to laugh. I had to laugh when you said use it appropriately. I was going to buy some coconut oil at a store. There's two women looking at them and talking about them. And which do you use? And what do you use? And I was curious to hear. Oh, how do they use it? Which one do they like? What do they cook with it? Turns out they were buying it for lotion. <laughs> oh, I've done that. I've done that, and um, it it doesn't sink into your skin very effectively. And I remember when that first started and I go to the chiropractor and you go to get adjusted and he's got to wipe down the whole table because everyone's lathering up with coconut oil and it's <laughs> sitting on top of the table and <laughs> it's, it's still sitting on top of your skin a few hours later. That's not an effective moisturizer, but yeah. it's also not going to kill yeah. you. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, if you want to know more about why fat is important in the diet, uh, I'm going to add a link to the comment section on an app time nutrition I did on fat and why you do need fat in your diet and why it's delicious. So um, thank you so much, Michelle, for joining me today. It was really valuable. And thanks for rolling with the technological punches there. <laughs> Sorry about that. And I didn't even know if I was live, but I tried to behave appropriately. <laughs> There's that word appropriate again. We're not really known for it. So <laughs> uh, you can find Michelle at the Taste Workshop. I, I added the link to the broadcast where you can find the the um the sheets that we were referring to, the guide to cooking oils That's and great. everyday cooking oils. Uh, so you can click on that. And Michelle does amazing cooking classes. I hope to get to one of them one of these days. And that's um, she's doing amazing things. So go check out the taste workshop and I will see you here next week for nap time nutrition. I have some really exciting things coming up. I have a personal stylist to talk about what you should and shouldn't have in your closet. And um, we've got a lot of fun stuff. I have a baby sign language specialist coming on talking about the link between sign language and a baby's relationship with food. And that's Wow. So it's all very exciting. So if you have any topics, suggestions, questions, comments for either myself or Michelle, please put it in the comment section. You don't want to miss next week and share this with anyone who may be confused about Flashpoint and is uh, 
maybe frying with some unrefined olive oil and causing lots of havoc in their house. So <laughs> thank you so much, Michelle. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.